All right. Well, I have noon mountain time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Raymond. I'm the Senior Director of Membership and Programs here at WCET. If this is your first webcast with us, we make it pretty informal, so feel free to jump in with chat. And if you have questions, go ahead and put those into the Q&A. We'll get to those as we can. But if you put your question into chat, it might get lost. So we do ask that you put your questions into the Q&A for the moderator. The slides can be downloaded via the link in the chat. And the recording links to any resources and the slides will be sent to all registrants early next week. Today's webinar is using your students' voices to inform your learning ecosystem. This webinar is in partnership with Academic Partnerships. Today's moderator is Robert Griffiths. Robert is the Assistant Vice Provost for Online Learning and Innovation at the, the Ohio State University. He's also a steering committee member and a good friend of WCET's. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Rob take it from here. Welcome, Rob. Hi, right, thanks, Megan. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and moderate today's session. And thank you for taking your time today. Uh, I know it's early afternoon for many of us or late morning for some of us. Uh, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to be able to introduce our presenters today. I will uh, introduce each one uh, by sharing who they are and where they are, um, what their role is and what organization they're associated with. And I'll invite each of our panelists to be able to share a little bit more about themselves as a part of an introduction. So first, I would like to introduce you to Takoya Boykins, Director of Academic Strategic Planning and Support with Academic Partnerships. Takoya, would you like to share a bit more about you and your role? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, as I just mentioned, I, I am the Director of Academic Strategic Planning and Support. Um, I'm an advocate for education with more than 20 years of experience in higher ed in various capacities, including uh, serving as business and education faculty, curriculum and instruction, assessment writing, and faculty development and more. I also serve on the board for AACSB. I have a heart for continuous growth and improvement and promote education in several ways to underserved and underrepresented populations who desire change through quality and innovative education. So happy to be here with you all today as we discuss ways that you can increase your impact. Thank you. Thanks, Takoya. Next, we have Dana Harrison, Chair, Department of Management, Marketing and Supply Chain and Director of MBA Programs with East Tennessee State University. Dana. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for um, having us here today. Um, I have been at East, East Tennessee State University for about 14 and a half years now. Um, as um, Robert was saying, I'm the chair of the Department of Management, Marketing, and Supply Chain, and I also oversee our, our MBA programs here. Um, I've been involved um, with our online class development for quite some time now um, and have had some experience since uh, the early years of when we first started putting these classes online. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some experiences and also hearing from others in terms of uh, what you're doing as well. So thank you, Rob. Thanks, Dana. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Lauren Wright, Director of Program Strategy with Academic Partnerships. Lauren. Thank you, Rob. Um, like Takoya, I have been working in higher education for a, a number of years, almost over 16 years, supporting many partners as they seek to grow online and develop online programs, guiding them from startup through to maturity. In my day-to-day -day operations, I have oversight of our academic program strategy with our partners. And I've had, I lead a team of colleagues that are responsible for working directly with academic partner leadership and, and faculty to design the best practices to bring into their online program from curriculum development, curriculum mapping, course design and production, and definitely supporting faculty through training, support and development. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. And we had a, a nice pre presentation conversation today and I was talking with the panelists and they were sharing about how much they enjoy receiving questions from our audience and being able to address the kind of questions and comments that you have on your mind. So as Megan mentioned at the top, please feel free to use the chat for comments and feedback and the question and answer module to help us uh, curate your questions and, and I can help them get to the panelists for answers. So at this point, let me turn it over to Takoya and help us kick off the presentation and conversation today. Thank you so much. 
Awesome. Thanks again, Rob. So before we begin, I would like to quickly review our agenda and the topics that we'll discuss today. So we'll begin by examining the voices of the online learner and how those voices impact the learning ecosystem. We'll then focus on institutional governance structures and the role they play in your learning ecosystem and supporting your students' voices. Dana will then share the digital journey of East Tennessee State University, including where they began in their journey and how they've shifted as their institutional community has changed. And from there, we'll open up for Q&A. So let's jump right in. The topics in our agenda today will allow us to explore the student voice and how it informs your school's eco-learning system. So we conducted a number of surveys that targeted online students, and today we'll focus on two of them. The surveys that we'll focus on are Voice of the Online Learner and the Online Learner Experience Report. The Voice of the Online Learner is a survey of online learners' preferences, behaviors, and their ways of selecting programs. Our 2023 report also added a lens of how the pandemic continues to shape the opinions of students seeking to further their credentials. And the online learner experience report is based on a survey of students from universities in partnership with us that identifies what influences online learner success and satisfaction in the online environment. So through the recent surveys that we've conducted, one thing that we know for sure is that this generation of online students has specific needs when looking for enrolling and completing a program. And what we can gather from this is that their needs are evolving. And because their needs are evolving, the way that we deliver and support their needs should evolve as well. Ultimately, these two surveys, students are sharing how they interact and how they are impacted by their institution's online learning ecosystem. So let's get into this just a little bit more. Let's first start by defining what a learning ecosystem is. In a formal context, such as a college or university, the learning ecosystem is typically a mix of people, technology, and other infrastructure that leads to certifications or degrees for students. And this can include campus strategy, technology, both for central administration and student access, your culture, resources, which includes the people, such as administration, faculty, even the students and the staff, and your teaching and and learning philosophy. This also includes student support for things such as accessibility. All of these things and more represent you. And the frustration that students may experience with just one element of your ecosystem for them actually equates to frustration with the entire school itself. So what we want you to think about is how you can improve and meet students where they are today. So let's jump back into the voice of the online learner survey. I want to call out what students shared about what influences their preferences, their behaviors, and their experiences when it comes to selecting and attending online programs. And there are plenty of them, but for the sake of today, we're just going to focus on three influences. And those influences are modality, program design, and credentials, both as certificates and standalone stackable credentials. Online learners prioritize modality over the institution. So when setting out to explore higher education options, most learners decide on modality first. And based on the survey, more than 83% of students say that they chose the online modality before any other factor. In fact, online learners reported that modality is more important than the institution where they study. So it's not always about name recognition or status quo. What we also found was that for some, online learning was also a pathway for students who had previously stopped out of their programs and desired to finish their degrees. Noting that 57% of online learners stated that their program wasn't offered online. And if it wasn't offered online at their college or university of choice, that they would be far more likely to find their program offered at another institution. So students prefer to stay local, but they need for your local programs to be offered online. So when you think of this and where your institution currently stands, ask yourself, how strong is your learning ecosystem with regards to supporting this type of learner? 
So the ideal program format isn't a one size fits all for all program types. We know that, right? However, learners favor eight week terms that are fully online and asynchronous. Now, some learners are open to taking multiple classes at once, as well as an occasional synchronous meeting from time to time. But they also want flexibility in choosing electives. So within online programs, learners are concerned about clarity around expectations, lack of interactions with instructors, and the need for engagement with their peers. Now, colleges and universities can alleviate these worries with well-prepared, supported instructors and policies around expectations and interactions with online students. And for prospective students, clear messaging and purposeful marketing about classroom interactions and expectations can help them to better gauge if your institution is indeed the right fit for them. Another interesting takeaway you can go to, there we go. Another interesting takeaway from the survey of learners is their interest in certificates and stackable credentials. And stackable credentials build up on prior learning. And two thirds of the respondents said that they were open to pursuing a non-traditional degree alternative in place of a college degree in the future. Now, trade skills certificates were the most popular alternative followed by industry certifications. And when thinking of your program structure, here's something to think about. In our Closing the Skills Gap 2023 report, HR leaders viewed degrees as important, but were open to interviewing candidates with alternative credentials. So for instance, when hiring for a role that typically designed, uh, that's created for someone with a degree, three quarters of HR professionals said that they would interview someone with five years of relevant work experience who had a certificate or a digital badge or micro credential as well. So although the full degree definitely still holds value, opportunities are available for online learners who prefer to pursue potentially less expensive and a quicker degree alternative. And we want to position ourselves for these students. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Lauren, who is gonna share more about the online learning experience and what you can do to better position yourself. Thank you, Takoya. So we also conducted a survey called our Online Learner Experience Report, where we had an opportunity to ask students to share what influences their online learning experiences. We asked students about the design of their online courses and we generated questions based on the industry-wide rubrics of Quality Matters and OSCAR. And, and we can head to the next slide real quick. When students were asked to open-ended questions, what contributed to their success, but also how could universities improve their online programs? Many of the comments focused on specific items related to course design. And where they centered were around how universities can strengthen consistency in course layout and navigation, not only at the course level, but at the program level. They also said don't shortchange our learning experiences. They, they can see the pattern of reading something and then posting and responding to a discussion forum. And while that's valid, how do we create more opportunities for that level of engagement? And they also said, let's be clear on expectation. I need to know when grades are gonna come in, how long it's gonna take to get a response responsiveness and clear expectations were really, really important to students. And as we see students starting to take online courses from one program and another and, and more um, uh, in, in those types of programs, students are gonna start to feel that disconnect between course layout and navigation. And as you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the comments that were shared. We highlight how the structure of the course was helpful it helped them stay organized, but also how it can be difficult and, and, and confusing if it's not really clear for them and helping them find what they need. We also asked students about faculty presence. And the, again, these questions were based on quality rubrics such as um, QM and OSCAR. Students find the majority of faculty very engaging and it contributes to their success. But there were a number of comments that students made that think otherwise, that gave us enough to pause and wonder what else was going on. And when we dug into that a little bit, we saw what themes emerged was the responsiveness of faculty. 
and how students are able to interact and feel that connection to faculty. Faculty disproportionately are valuable to a student's success. Also looking at the responses, we saw that students can notice when faculty don't feel fully connected to a course. They've come in, they're teaching an extra section, they're teaching two sections, but they didn't design the course in its whole entirety. How do we help faculty really feel that connection so they can continue to have that strong presence in their courses? And lastly, to highlight, students want to be able to connect and learn from their peers. I think we're going to see that different, different degree types value that a little bit more, but students value the interaction and the opportunities to learn from their peers, and it contributes to them feeling success and their overall satisfaction. And on the next slide, you can see some of the comments that are reflected there. And again, as student satisfaction is disproportionately weighted to faculty, where schools can really look at their learning ecosystem, is having that team that can support them by sharing research, best practices, success stories, to help faculty understand what the learning needs are, but then they too can feel the support that they need in order to meet those changing student needs. We also looked at one more survey that really highlighted the growth of online. And while many of us are trying to get back to that feeling of the pre-2019 COVID normal, growth and change is still abound. And, and, and how are we looking forward? There was one question that stood out in the survey and it asked provosts and chief academic officers in that role, how likely are you to continue expanding and growing online programs? And while some said, no, not at all, a resounding over 80% said we have it as a clear priority and strategy to target growth in online courses and programs and offerings. And so that really speaks to the fluidity and growth and, and expansion of a learning ecosystem. So we ask you here on this call, how does your institution fit into this survey? And how would you rate your learning institution's learning ecosystem in response to meeting your students' needs, all of them, whether they're ground-based and they're taking an occasional online course, they're in a hybrid program, or they're in a fully online program. We know that governance structures at colleges and universities shape how decisions are made and how results are realized. And so if we go to the next slide, we're gonna focus and highlight on how decision-making can play a role in shaping your learning ecosystem for your online learners, and your faculty. On the next slide, we highlight two main groups of decision-making, uh, decision-making approaches, that is. We've got a, a, a centralized approach and a decentralized approach, and we've highlighted on the left-hand side examples of, of where the learning ecosystem can, can be impacting through, it can be impacted through the decision-making approach. With a more centralized governing structure, decision-making and learning and your learning ecosystem are highly coordinated and integrated through a, a single decision-making unit. And this can include how to spend your, your, your resources, what, um, what technology you need, what your policies are, how you're going to administer and, and develop technology needs. And that decentralized approach, what's seen as a more distributed decision-making where your central administration unit may focus on the macro management of the institution, but the academic units get to decide what is best for them, what resources they need, what IT, what, um, what staffing needs that they have. And, and clearly no institution is, is, is fully in either bucket. We, we blend and we incorporate different aspects at different times, whether it's centralized or decentralized. The culture will dictate at that institution how smooth the relationship is between these governing bodies and how much of an opportunity there is on shared governance. There are distinctive implications on your decision-making approaches that impact your learning ecosystem. Organizations are fluid, technology is making us shift, resources are shifting as a result, but also student expectations and learning needs are shifting. And, and how are we at our institutions responding to that? And how are we prepared? I want to highlight real quickly, uh, before we pass, um, we transition to Dana to share how East, East Tennessee State University has tackled their digital journey. I want to highlight some of the advantages and disadvantages of these decision-making approaches. And that centralized decision-making approach 
the central admin and campus units, we're all rowing in the same direction. There is a major focus all in supporting the institutional strategy, agreement on defining standards and expectations for online learners, resources for such as accessibility and best practices. There may even be a center for teaching and learning that is funded to support all faculty at the institution. But it can come with some drawbacks. And that is with that singular approach of decision making, it can, it can stifle entrepreneurship. And that's, that's the hub where new ideas come about. Curiosity and energy comes from exploring, prototyping, maybe missing the mark, but continuing to try again and solutioning. It's synergistic and energizing for a team to come together rather, and, and, and this can stifle that opportunity to grow and explore new ideas. And that decentralized setup, greater autonomy is with resourcing and exploration. Faculty who are closest to the students get to decide the tools, technologies, and learning approaches. And the theme is more, let me, uh, instead of asking for permission, beg for forgiveness. But challenges can happen with this one too, This too, it, going too deeply into this approach. You can, with this increased um, at entrepreneurship, successes can result in being siloed. What's happening in one team may not transition to another team. And so an event, in a sense, we are reinventing the same wheel and spending resources and time on the same problem. Without a communication czar, learns from one group of explorers may not get transferred over. It's also hard to adopt best practices. And as students are shifting courses and taking an online course in one program and perhaps an online course in another program, they're going to feel those differences as our students already highlighted. So just a little bit of the advantages and disadvantages as you think about the types of governing structures at your institution and how that can impact your learning ecosystem. But we really wanna hear from, from Dana Harrison. She has been instrumental in helping guide East Tennessee State University on their digital journey as they progressed from one or two online courses to now fully online programs really impacting and examining her the institution's learning ecosystem. Thank you, Lauren. So with information at our fingertips online, there really has never been a better time to learn and hone our skills, uh, learn something new. I think uh, this became even more obvious during COVID. Um, how many people learned a new skill such as baking sourdough bread? Um, I even know somebody that taught himself Arabic from the tools that were actually available online. So we know that we know students are um, increasingly desiring to take courses in a fully online environment, as I think Takoya and Lauren actually pointed out. And there are even changes in attitudes of students and faculty related to online learning since pre-COVID. So an inside higher education survey found that 57% of students are more optimistic and 58% of faculty are more optimistic when it comes to learning online. So there are even more positives related to online programs, but programs online have more racially diverse student bodies than conventional schools. And that results from a study um, conducted by Arizona State University indicate that online courses were associated with improved access and retention, which is important for, I think, for all of us. So ETSU has been around for a while, uh, since 1911. Uh, we're located in Johnson City. Um, if you listen to country music, it is the same place mentioned in Darius Rucker's song, Wagon Wheel. And just for your reference, uh, it's about 20 minutes from Virginia and North Carolina. We're at the top right corner of the state. So uh, we have around 14,500 500 students, and as you can see, we attract students from really all over the world. Um, we, uh, the initial goal of our online education uh, for us was really related to growth and flexibility for our students. So we have a very large first-generation student population, as well as non-traditional students. And this flexibility really allows them to work and provide care for their family members, but they can also obtain their degree. So these groups are really important to consider. And I think Tukoya uh, pointed out something early on about this, um, but it not only opens windows to greater career opportunities for them, but it also, because in 2021, 14.4 uh, million adults actually had some college, but no actual degree. So um, something to consider there. Many years ago now, we were asked to think um, at in the College of Business and Technology about whether we could develop online versions of our courses. So we were planning uh, to just trial out some options for students, a sort of dip our toe in the water and determine what was really needed and desired by our students. Uh, so we first started offering occasional online courses for students. 
uh, there wasn't really a strategy um, early on. It was sort of to jump in and just sort of get started. Um, the Department of Academic Technology Services, though, was created around 2008, and they were really there to help support the development and review of our online courses. Uh, this department actually recruits an online liaison now from each college, um, and this online liaison is sort of this first step in reviewing online course development. Uh, the initial review is done by a specific college liaison, and then it's sort of pushed on to be um, to be reviewed by the entire liaison team and members of the academic technology services department. All of our online courses actually have to be approved using the quality matters guidelines. I think Lauren or Tapoya mentioned this previously. And if faculty are interested, though, they can also provide they can also apply for a pretty decent stipend. And um, the, but the stipend does vary depending upon whether the course is um, hybrid, synchronous, or asynchronous, and also really the overall score uh, related to the final course review. But academic technology services also provide substantial assistance for faculty developing courses. Um, I sort of think of them as D2L Jedi's. Um, we use uh, D2L at ETSU, and they know how to do just about anything that you want to do in D2L. Um, and they financially support online le learning opportunities as well for faculty um, to undergo additional training. Um, a course goes through the review process every three years. So uh, you have to go through that, undertake that additional process every three years. Um, and the online score, scoring rubric, if you are interested um, and you don't currently have one, it does follow the quality matters, but it actually can be found on ETSU. ETSU webpage. So uh, we have other departments involved as well. So the Department of Information Technology Services and Marketing Communications is actually involved in supporting faculty uh, with video creation and program promotion through digital advertising. And they also maintain a webpage for us dedicated to all of the online programs. So we're heavily involved um, with them um, with most of our um, online courses as well as programs. So as we move to the next slide, um, I'll actually discuss some elements from our digital journey. So we take the more decentralized approach to uh, determining what classes to offer online. So um, as Lauren was pointing out, there's sort of a, you can think about it in terms of centralized or decentralized. Uh, we take that decentralized approach. Um, proposing an online course just involves a conversation with the department chair, uh, since this is who really creates the schedules. Um, since most of the courses in our department have been proposed for online development at least once in the past, we rarely have new proposals. Uh, for us though, it's really important to determine what's necessary for each department, thinking about it really as a strategy. Um, and this has grown over the years. I think initially we were just sort of trying to dip our toe in the water, um, determine exactly, you know, what is this online course and how can we offer it to students? And now we've really shifted to more of a st strategic thinking about this. Um, but this can range from providing more flexibility to students, but also developing new online programs, which is something that we, we've um, increasingly done. Unfortunately, COVID did force everybody into a crash course in developing an online option. Uh, similar to probably all universities, though, like I mentioned, we actually did have an LMS system in place. We do use D2L. Some faculty have really become well-versed, though, in video production, and um, that's an area, obviously, that's a huge strength if you are teaching online. Um, and we do have an office that is very patient with us and helps us develop professional-looking videos, also a huge plus. Um, another tool that I've found helpful um, outside of something that the university really provides uh, in my classes is using something very basic such as GroupMe. So if you're unfamiliar with the tool, it offers a system similar to texting, but it really does help me in an online environment communicate with my students um, if they have questions and I do respond to them as long as I'm awake and not in a meeting is what I usually tell them. Um, but this also allows other students to see questions that usually at least, let's face it, probably one other student in the class has, um, and they receive almost immediate feedback, not only from me, but also sometimes their peers, which I think is really helpful in the learning process. Um, but this is obviously my personal decision and it's not an expectation of faculty um, to you know, respond to, to communications around the clock or anything like that. Um, but faculty really do have the autonomy to decide what tools outside of D2L obviously are right for them to help augment their communication and engagement with students. But I've also seen other faculty use something called Discord, which is pretty interesting. 
and um, to connect with their students. But we are now starting to implement generative AI, so Gen AI, uh, mainly ChatGPT at this point, for student support and retention, um, such as with personalized content tutoring or even syllabus developing sort of a custom GPT for syllabus question and answers. And also in the area of faculty productivity and student learning and productivity inside the classroom. But for one of our online graduate programs, we developed an MOU with faculty expectations in terms of course development. I think this was mentioned by maybe Laura or Chipoya earlier on as well in, to consider, but it covers areas such as teaching ex expectations, which includes things that we sort of expect, such as video production, um, maybe what type of student engagement is expected, um, different modules, uh, how the course should be laid out, uh, grading turnaround time, and um, also course development concerns considerations and maintenance. So for this program in particular, we created the same structure for all the courses. Um, and I think that was highlighted in one of Lauren's slides so that students would understand how to navigate from one class to another with ease. And this is really helpful because this particular program does operate in seven week formats. So each class is seven weeks in length. So our students enjoy online learning and they really do often highlight the depth and breadth covered in the classes. Um, but this is really attributed to um, the content creation by the instructor and they really do appreciate the different learning methods and we try to request different learning methods by the faculty such as not only short readings um, maybe current event articles introduced midweek um, to really connect that material with practice but also introductory videos for the week maybe also a 15-minute learning lectures by the instructor trying to keep it short so that they remain connected and engaged um, and there are usually a variety of these learning options embedded into d2l for each class so I do feel it's important to ensure academic excellence through helping faculty understand strengths and weaknesses. Not everyone adapts well to online learning um, and helping select optimal online instructors to really create these exceptional learning experiences for students, I think is very critical. Um, we do try to make an effort to unify faculty around a passion for mentoring students in the, because it is different, obviously, than on ground situations and um, really establishing standards and expectations through the MOUs that I mentioned, but also inspiring faculty to continuously seek learning opportunities because it's ever-changing and evolving all the time. So um, I think uh, also something important for faculty to consider here is reviewing student assessment of instruction reports um, and evaluating in the instruction and really opportunities for enhancement in these areas. And then as we move to the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about sort of the outcomes for us, really, um, I mentioned the College of Business and Technology here, um, but really the Department of Management, Marketing and Supply Chain. Um, our business students obtain a BBA, and we actually have a BBA core, core, core business curriculum, similar to probably most institutions. Um, but that means that anyone in our econ, finance, accounting, management, marketing, and supply chain uh, majors, they all have the same core curriculum. Um, and then at least one of these courses are offered online almost every semester. Uh, the advisors have a schedule that helps our 100% online students navigate this, the, um, the schedule and really plan accordingly so that they can graduate when they need to graduate or when they desire to graduate. Um, the business side of our courses are online during the summer. Uh, this is optional, though, and it really can change uh, depending upon what a department decides is appropriate. Um, but having a class at 10 a.m. during the summer, you know, several days a week isn't really helpful for students. A lot of our students do return home um, and they desire to get ahead on coursework. So that might limit what options they have available. Um, but a lot of students also do seek internships um, and work full time. So. Uh, those that gives them another some flexibility there um, and the asynchronous online option really makes courses completely accessible to all students. So uh, we've trialed out a required student orientation for one of our online programs. Uh, this contains not only a boot camp for quantitative courses, which in this case is important again because this is the seven week uh, course structure, but it also introduces the students to university resources that are available to them in a learning and personal capacity. So uh, in terms of the Department of Management, Marketing, and Supply Chain, we offer two 100% online undergraduate programs, uh, Management and Marketing, as well as two 100% online graduate programs, and that's our Master's of Science in Digital Marketing and our Master's in Business Administration. So we continue to try to balance so our online and offline options for students because we know there are some students that still seek that traditional approach, um, but we also know that most of them are moving at least towards wanting hybrid learning or 100% learning online. So I think um, the next slide, 
might be Q and A. So. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much. This was a wonderful overview, a wealth of information, and we have started getting a no end of questions coming through the Q&A chat. So this is great. And Dana, I'm going to ask you to continue talking for a little bit here because a couple of the initial questions are centered around the topic areas that you just helped shared with all of us. Um, first, I was hoping that you could share one or two challenges that you've experienced on your digital journey. Like how was your institution able to work through those challenges and sort of arrive stronger on the other side? I think so. I've, um, I was in industry before coming to academia and I've been here at ETSU for about 14 and a half years. And I think some of the challenges has just been the evolution of how students are learning and also what is being desired online, because we have really moved, you know, when we put courses online many years ago, video production honestly wasn't as, as big of a, th a thing, right? So we would record over PowerPoint presentations or something like that. There was just little, you know, video recording option. We would just record our voiceover. We do a voiceover, but I think that this has really evolved and what students are sort of wanting has evolved. We are, um, I mean, you think about things that are really attractive to that gen that population now are things like TikTok, right? So short videos, it can get to the point. Um, there is uh, an interesting, um, there's and I'm going to promote her now unintentionally. I have no connection to this person, but um, she, she, I think she's called like the Excel lady or something like that. And what she does is she teaches these short uh, version, these short lessons in Excel. And that got me really thinking. And I saw that actually, I think at the very beginning of COVID into how maybe we can incorporate the, that approach into our classes because some companies saw what she was doing online and actually started hiring her to do that for their company because it was so engaging. So I think, you know, this stuff is all evolving all the time. And uh, I think we just have to stay current on what is, you know, coming down um, in terms of an opportunity for us to adopt. Um, so I think that's the biggest challenge is just staying current and maybe even slightly ahead, if at all possible, in terms of what our students not only desire, but what they need as well. So. Thank you. And, and actually, there's a couple other follow-up questions on more around the technology pieces of the strategy that you just shared. One is a more direct question around, have you integrated chat GPT directly with D2L or what is that relationship between the chat GPT that you're talking through and the learning management system? Yeah, so we are actually doing that right now. Um, we have a faculty member that is developing a um, GPT, so um, they're they're using it in terms of their syllabus. I actually plan to do it in the fall semester as well, but that's what I'm planning to do over the summer semester. Um, I I can actually, if you connect with me um, offline, I can send you um, all the resources that I have in terms of um, generative AI. Um, I've been looking into that quite a bit the last several months. Um, I can provide you um, with some information there. A lot of universities now have some great resources, um, and I have a list of those as well that I can share with you. Um, but yeah, we're seeing it, I would say, though, mainly in those three different areas that I mentioned. Um, so not only in that sort of that tutoring, that student support area, um, but also in an area where it can support faculty and also in an area where students can obviously learn that in class, because we are seeing that um, not only from the tutorial side and everything that we can, so we can you know implement that in detail, but on the student learning side, we are seeing that some employers are saying, if your students do not know ChatGPT or do not know how to use this to augment their potential future job, you know, when they're, um, when they're interviewing, we will not consider them. And so that, I've heard that from several people from different companies now, and that sort of um, hit home in terms of, you know, where we need to be thinking in the next couple of years. So. Huh. So it's not just East Tennessee State that's dealing with that stuff, huh? That's crazy. <laughs> Sounds like a very familiar conversation. And another familiar conversation, and Dana, this might be for you, but it might also be for our, our academic partners, colleagues here. There is a balance around academic freedom and uh, technology compliance and, and work around how do we help explore new technologies, but also making sure things are accessible and meet intellectual property and other sort of rights. Can you talk a bit about how you're approaching that governance of technology use in your online courses and kind of how you're balancing the student experience and compliance needs with the creativity and innovation that faculty might want to be advancing? 
I don't know if I have, um, if I'm, if I'm responding to this question correctly, but what I will say, I mean, we, we obviously adhere to, we, we have a department, the, the, um, act, the technology services department that really helps us make sure that we are adhering to all the requirements there. So, and the library helps with us quite a bit. Um, we had some instances recently where uh, there were some things that were sort of out out of compliance, you know, so I think faculty had just no idea. And so, um, but the library helped us find the resources to be in compliance. Um, and so, and with technology, um, I mean, we do a lot of, I teach quantitative marketing classes and we use a lot of technology in class, but those are open to students. So, I mean, anything that we use are, is usually open access to students or it's something we can find through the library to help us. Sequoia, Lauren, anything more in terms of what you've seen through your partnerships around this, this tension point? I think it's just being sure that you have a clear line of communication. It's not about no to technology, but it is about making sure that everyone who's supposed to use it can have the right level of access to it. And so we, given that level of support, there does need to be time to be able to adjust and respond and reflect, but it doesn't, you know, if you're really looking at having that, the, the, the distributed or that open level of governance, it's having an opportunity to make effective decisions, but not a no, you didn't go out of the, you, you went down the wrong path. Yep, yeah, and kind of to those lines too, um, oftentimes when we think about the use of technology in our online platforms, we're using technology just for the sake of using it, right? And so we want to make sure that we're using the right technology that actually adds value to what we're doing in the classroom, because if not, it's a waste of time. But in regards to the accessibility component of things, um, if you do have um, a center for teaching and learning or available instructional designers who can also help you to navigate that process, a lot of the learning management systems or the LMS will have a number of accessibility features uh, or accessibility checks that are kind of naturally built into the platform that can help you with that process as well. And it'll flag you if there are some accessibility concerns, but then, but you're also, you all also might have others on your campus who can help support you with those initiatives as well. Intentionality. I love it. That sounds like a great idea. Let's keep doing that. All right, so another place where there can be tensions at times, you know, tension can make great music, uh, a string of an instrument, but sometimes tension can make things break. Another tension area that we often see is the difference between the goals and priorities and directions of a IT, either individual or team that resides within a department or within a centralized support unit and the teaching and learning professionals within a unit or at a university. Dana, Takoya, Lauren, are there any strategies you've seen or aha moments that you've experienced uh, helping to navigate these two parties to be able to understand and work with one another in ways that help advance online education in an effective way? It boils down to partnership, right? Even on an institutional level. And oftentimes, um, you know, when when we sit in other departments outside of the classroom, outside of faculty, we tend to make decisions without including the faculty. So when we talk about having faculty buy-in and putting faculty at the helm of everything that we do, that includes learning from them and hearing from them. So it's critical that when we're making technology decisions that we involve the faculty as much as we can. I know there might be some limitations in some ways, but we involve them as much as we can to ensure that we're really meeting their needs because the faculty is who knows the student. So they know not only what they need, but what the student needs as well. And so I think just making sure that everything that you do, it's a true partnership from start to finish will help to alleviate some of the concerns and frustrations that come with uh, what we might consider an outside party who's making technology decisions on behalf of us who are actually on the front line. Thank you. I'm going to give Dana a moment to catch her breath from all the questions that she answered and, and to, to call you as well. Lauren, I was going to ask you a question around student feedback. So considering the comments that students have shared about their online course experience, did you notice if the comments uh, differed at all based on the type of program that they were enrolled in? You know, it, that is an interesting question because, yes, we do tend to see differences 
date based on the type of degree and the type of student that's going into those programs. For example, your MBA students, they want to get in, they want to complete the work, they want to learn, demonstrate mastery, excellence, and get out. They don't, their, their idea and their connections necessarily to group work and strong relationships, while important always, aren't necessarily a make or break experience for them. But if you look at our healthcare programs, our social work, our nursing programs, those fields are very much a caretaker role. Um, and that type of nurturing and that type of support from students as well as with faculty really resonate out. And it's, it's noted when it's missed because they're wanting to seek that type of um, feedback and connection as they further their degree. Thank you. And, and staying on the element of student success and student support, I, I was wondering, Lauren and Dana, if you would be able to talk a bit about any sort of information you can share more about the online orientation for graduate students. What When is that occurring and, and how does it operate? Is it synchronous, asynchronous? Is it held online within desire to learn? Talk a bit about that onboarding orientation process if you can. Dana, I'm going to give this one to you. We can talk in general about orientations, but I, Dana, I really want to hear your how East Tennessee State is using your orientation. Uh, we do it uh, previous to, so we, we allow entry into this program six times per year. So students do this before the first day of their start time. Uh, it is completely asynchronous online. Videos are pre-recorded for the quantitative modules that I mentioned. Um, and then we have, we provide basically a map uh, of what all the resources that are available to them, um, you know, on campus and off of campus uh, in a virtual type manner, um, because we do have students from all over the, the world in this program, so. Another aspect just to add to, to online orientation as well is that oftentimes when we think about orientation, we think about orientation just from the very start of the program. Uh, something to start kind of thinking about and revisioning when we're thinking about orientation is looking at it more of a student success hub and how can you incorporate it throughout the lifetime of the online program. And so that it's not just a one-stop shop, right? Because once the student gets to you know, course number four, which might be a research course, they might really need to come back to that orientation and really reflect on some support systems and some resources that you have available to your students. And so when you're thinking about that one, yes, it's embedded into your LMS system, be it D2L, Canvas, or whatever it is you might use, but the orientation is something that's accessible that students can come back to at any point to be able to get the information that they need, which also means that it's updated often so that the resources are current and relevant. And so if there's some additional tools or some, some additional um, you know, support factors that your institution is adding in, that those are also made available to students on a regular basis as well. Yeah, I really appreciate that concept. And part of it is that ongoing community for student success mm -hmm. and to set expectations and to know where to go to get help for X, Y, and Z issue. Exactly. And let me extend upon that a bit in terms of the theme. Part of that is then helping to understand what kind of experience you may have in this program. What are some of the rules of engagement and rules of the role type of thing? And, and I was hoping that maybe Dana or one of you could be able to talk about exams and academic integrity and how you're managing that process either through proctoring or by expectation setting or more to help ensure that the student is finding success in that program. This is really course um, dependent. So this is really um, depends upon sort of how the course is structured. So. In my courses in particular, I place more emphasis on projects. And so I place less emphasis on um, quizzes. And so I really, um, the quizzes for me, it's just really like a reading check. So I, because of this, I, I, I don't sift through videos. A lot of times uh, there are a couple of different ways to really monitor um, 
or maybe proctor is not the right word. There's a proctoring way where you can have students register for, for a service and they can, you know, sort of do the digital proctoring. But then there's also a way where you can record them in D2L. And um, I don't use either of those just simply because I've decided to take a different route and not really put much emphasis on there uh, on the quizzes just for that for that reason. Uh, you, you know, there's just too much opportunity uh, for sharing of information. And um, so I don't put much, put much weight on there. Some faculty though, they use the D2L option that's embedded in D2L uh, where they can record them and it flags sort of um, different kinds of movements and, and those types of things. And then there's that proctoring option. The proctoring option is something we have been discussing, but it does cost, it is an added cost for students. Um, and so, you know, I think it's determining is, is it something that we can use across the program that all faculty are going to use in their courses? Is it going to be, you know, is there going to be a value there for the student to purchase access to something like that? And so that's a consideration. And, and but it's really, you know, I think course specific um, in terms of, you know, what, whether you need to even think about implementing something like that or not. Thank you. I'm just watching time here, and I think we have time for one to three more questions. We'll see kind of what response we get from all of that. And Takoya, I'm, I'm hoping to take the next question to you. And okay. this is around online program design concepts. Could you help us understand how you would approach shifting a program that really has traditionally been semester long and start to rethink how do we bring them to an eight week or half term type of course? Absolutely. Great question and a common question. So we hear that quite a bit. But the, the first thing is that you first want to start by assessing your program outcomes. So you really want to ensure that they're crafted in a way that really truly positions the student to be successful to accomplish those outcomes. So you want to start here also because you want to ensure that your curriculum and that your activities are properly mapped to those. And so when you do that, it helps you to kind of weed out some of the fluff that you might have in your course or what we might call the good to know um, information. But when you use um, a mapping system, it could be digitally, it could be a paper form, but some form of a course map, you'll it will allow you to really kind of look at your existing course content and really pull out the most important information or the information that students absolutely need to know. And when you're trying to identify what that information is or what the need to know information is versus the nice to know information, you want to think about some of those aha moments, right, that students have had um, in the course. What is really applicable to industry standards? Um, are um, are the assignments, there surely are assignments in your courses where students just really, really got the concepts. Um, even activities or discussions where students really took the extra mile because the content was applicable to them. And dare I say, because they actually enjoyed it. So those are the types of components of your curriculum that you really wanna think about to help you to really build out your eight week course coming from a 16 week course. A lot of times people think that it's impossible, right? And But it's it seems impossible because you wanna pull in the full 16 weeks of the of the material. Well, you can't do that. Um, but you have to find ways to kind of work around that and really pull out what's really, really important. And then where you have space, then you can add in some of that nice to know information. And sometimes the nice to know information might even be in the form of informal discussions that you're able to include into your course. And then at that point, you can start to think about how you can weave in technology and multimedia aspects of the course and so forth. So really start with your outcomes, both from a program and a course level and then really sit down and have a mapping system that really helps you to identify how you can do that seamlessly. Intentionality and alignment. I like it. <laughs> Let's do that. That's right. That's right. So I feel like uh, bringing the slide back up on the screen is kind of like being at the Grammys and having the music starting, but I'm just going to keep talking with one more question before we close things out <laughs> with Megan. So sorry for that, Megan. And Dana, I'm going to put this question to you. And it's, again, another tension point of sorts. Not necessarily tension, but oftentimes a conversation that occurs among faculty thinking about online programs. And this is the balance between the theory and concepts and learning outcomes, and then the tangible skills that might come from specific certifications and helping to embed those. And kind of comes in from the AI conversation before of what industry partners are saying that they would love to see graduates be able to be able to do moving into their career field. And can you just talk a bit about the, for a couple minutes, uh, what that conversation has been like for you and your faculty about the connection of these things? 
I think we usually try to approach things. Um, we we have a lot of industry partners involved in our curriculum development, as well as um, sort of um, the we, we get them involved in conversations quite often. We also benchmark against other institutions as well to kind of see what other people are doing, um, but uh, mainly focusing on bringing our industry partners into these conversations because they're hiring our students, right? So um, it's important to know what our students need in terms of this, the knowledge and skills when they leave us. And um, so I think inviting industry partners is really critical uh, to, to know sort of the most important components that should be in a class um, and uh, what you should be teaching your students. Uh, one of the most important, obviously, you know, your instructor is the expert in that discipline in terms of research and academic training, um, but it's always good to have that industry perspective as well. And going back to Takoya on the previous question, we we actually um, did decrease our classes from 14 to seven weeks in our online MBA program a couple of years ago. And um, it was an interesting conversation, but it really did involve the industry experts, us having a conversation and saying, okay, this is our course content. Uh, you know, what is really necessary and uh, what, you know, we want to teach them. We don't want to, we don't want a bunch of fluff in our classes, right? So what, what do they need to know? What is most critical right now at this point in time? And, and so, and in, in going on in the future, right? And so that's, we, we really do uh, respect their opinions and get them involved as much as possible. Thank you. And as I turn it over to Megan to help close us out of today's session, please join me in a virtual thank you and round of applause for Dana, Takoya, and Lauren. Thank you so very much for sharing your expertise with us today. Great. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Rob, for your wonderful job moderating and keeping on top of all those questions. Again, the webcast recording will be shared and we'll send links to all the reports that were shared as well. And do keep an eye out for our Defining Distance Ed uh, report that will be coming out in the next week or so. If you want to know more about WCET, check our website out. We have lots of great events coming up you don't want to miss. And again, thank you to our valuable partner, Academic Partnerships. And here's two events that you want to put on your calendar. Um, we have two member-only closer conversations coming up that will help you navigate everything you need to know about proposed federal regulations, as well as those that are going into effect July 1. And then we have a free webcast open to everybody uh, about micro-credentials and how to tap into those 40.4 million learners that are sitting out there looking for somewhere to apply their knowledge. And that's on May 7th. And then we have an in-person distance ed at the Crossword, Crossroads uh, Regulatory Summit, and that's in St. Louis. And the annual meeting, the program and registration is right around the corner and it's going to be very compelling. You won't want to miss it. I can tell you that much. Thank you to all of our partners that underwrite our events and programs here at WCET. We're very grateful for their investment. It really helps us do the best work that we can and share that with you broadly and our supporting members. So again, thank you, everybody. Appreciate the questions and thank you for the engagement. We'll see you on a soon uh, webcast or event. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.